All right. So um, WSO2 platform is all about um, giving you the technology and the tools and the platform for building digital experiences. So in this uh, panel discussion, we're going to talk a little bit about um, um, what tailored digital journeys are and why they're important and uh, get these gentlemen to share some of their experiences in um, doing so in their respective organizations. Um, so I'm going to um, start off with uh, you, Andre. Um, um, what are te uh, tailored digital journeys or digital experiences, and uh, why do you think they are important? I'd be happy to share. So basically, think about a custom di tailored digital journey as a custom personalized digital experience. Uh, when, you're, when your customers are navigating your, your digital assets, your websites, your mobile applications, you want to make sure that they're having good experiences. Um, at Hard Rock, we curate digital experiences across our many, many different um, digital assets. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about what Hard Rock is. I work for Hard Rock. Hi, everybody. Um, so that you can understand why digital experiences are so important. So Hard Rock, many of you know, you guys are at this hotel, so you know that Hard Rock has hotels, right? This is a Hard Rock hotel and casino. Um, we have a Hard Rock hotel line of business. We also have a Hard Rock Cafe. You're probably familiar that Hard Rock has cafe, Hard Rock cafes. We started with our first one in 1971 in London, England. Um, we also have a casino business. So you've seen a casino here. Um, we have 13 casinos, including the Mirage in Las Vegas that we bought a couple years ago, where we're gonna put one of these amazing guitar hotels um, soon on the fabulous Las Vegas trip. We have retail business. We have um, a couple hundred retail stores across the globe where you can buy these uh, Hard Rock shirts, guitar hotel shirts like this. We have online businesses. We have online retail. We have online games. We have hundreds of online games. We have online casinos. We have sports betting online. We're live with sports betting in 13 states, including Florida. While you're here on this trip, if you want to make a, a bet on your favorite team, you can walk over to the sports book, or you can download the Hard Rock Bet app. It's the only legal sports bet in Florida. Um, we have museums where you can see all of your favorite artists, um, memorabilia from all over the world. And the last one I'm going to share, we have many other lines of business, but Hard Rock has a vast ecosystem of businesses. The last one I'm going to share that I bet none of you knew that's really interesting is we have gas stations. Did anybody, did anybody know that? We have Hard Rock has gas. Oh, well, that doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> These guys work for Hard Rock. Wait a minute, infiltrators. Um, so Hard Rock has gas stations. You can go to the pump. There's one right over here um, where you can use your Hard Rock Unity points to buy gas, and you can earn points while you're buying gas. It's really interesting. Coming back to these digital journeys, and I'm going to share two of them from Hard Rock. But um, Hard Rock is about physical fun experiences. People come to all these entities I shared to have fun, right? That's what they come to Hard Rock for. Digital, it's important that when they're using our digital assets, and we have lots of websites, lots of mobile applications to support all these physical entities, but these digital journeys overlap the physical experiences. And so our journeys that we curate are digital along with physical experiences because at the end of the day, people are coming to Hard Rocks to have fun. Um, so two tailored digital journeys that I'll share with you guys that we use, and we have you know, thousands of them. Um, one is VIP for virtual host. So I'm going to use a uh, persona, v Mary VIP, who is uh, an avid customer of Hard Rock. She's a VIP, um, and she's being assigned a digital virtual host. So this is a digital um, experience that we're providing for our customers. We're developing this right now, where we're going to provide a digital VIP virtual host. You guys might have seen Rody over here. Rody's a, a virtual assistant that'll help you while you're on property here, um, help you book reservations for dining, help send uh, room service to your room. Uh, think of our VIP virtual host as Rody on steroids. So Mary VIP is an avid customer. She's interested in, in, in coming to Hard Rock, but she doesn't want to do a lot of work. So we want to make it easy for Mary VIP. So we have a virtual host that is going to send Mary a text message. Mary might be sitting at home listening to Carol G. She loves Carol G. Um, sitting at home, our VIP virtual host will send Mary a text message and says, hey, Mary, we know you love Carol G. Carol G is playing at the Hard Rock Stadium over here in Miami. You got two tickets up front waiting for you. We know you love the Guitar Hotel. You got a night for, for two. Uh, waiting for you for free. We know you love Kuro. Um, you love Japanese food. We know you love Kuro. You've got a uh, dinner for two at Kuro. Um, and, and for any of you that are here, if you haven't tried Kuro, it's my favorite, one of my favorite restaurants in the world. Try the sea bath, super delicious. 
Um, so we got, we got dinner for two at Curl, and you live in Naples, Mary VIP, we, it's difficult for you to get from Naples over here. We're going to send a helicopter to pick you up, one of the Hard Rock helicopters, to pick you up in Naples, fly you over to the Guitar Hotel. We've got several, several helicopters that we do exactly that. So Mary got all these offers sitting on her couch at home. She had to do nothing. She didn't have to go to the website. She didn't have to go to the mobile application. She didn't have to come to Hard Rock. And she did nothing. She sat on her couch. Mary replies, yep, I'll take this, this, and this. She's going to say, although I love curl, can you switch it to Council Oak? I love a good steak. Um, at, the bottom, at the end of the day, the bottom line is this VIP virtual assistant is a digital experience. It's going to book all those offers for her in our, in our, in our reservation system for dining, for hotel. Um, it's going to range with the player's development for the helicopter. And so this is something that is extremely low effort for Mary VIP. And this is one example of a digital experience that we curate for our, our customers. Um, one more I'll share briefly because it's going to be pertinent later on is um, Unity. So Unity is our global loyalty program. Um, it's been a massive, massive implementation that connects the entire world, all those lines of businesses that I described into one loyalty program. In order to ensure that our customers can benefit from all of our different experiences, we had to deliver digital experiences in, in the website and the mobile application so that our customers could understand everything that we have to offer. And so we curate lots of tailored digital journeys across our, our digital assets, um, as well as enabling our customers to, to view what they've done at our properties, to view their points, to use their points, and so on. And so Unity is a really important um, program for Hard Rock that connects the entire world. Um, but also we need to provide amazing digital experiences for our customers. So that's another curated digital experience that we had to produce. Thanks, Andre. That was very interesting. Um, next, I'm going to um, uh, turn it to Steve. Um, so, Steve, what are some of the key aspects that should be considered um, when uh, designing Taylor digital, digital journeys? Thank you. Um, so I'm going to piggyback on, on what Andre uh, just mentioned here. Um, you notice he started with a persona. Um, so who is the customer, right? Who are you focused on? Um, what is the friction you know, that they may have? Or I would say, what problem are you trying to solve for them? Right? Those are kind of the, the two key elements for, for us when we start out. Again, who are we focusing this effort on in the journey? And what problem are we going to solve for them? And again, that problem may be something that they didn't know they had a problem with yet. I was going to say it might be a new ca capability or offer, there, or it may be a, a, a real actual issue um, inside of the flow. So that's really where we start, you know, is again, clear identification of who that customer is, um, and then looking at, uh, again, how do they interact with our environment today? How should they be interacting with it? Or how do we think they should be interacting with it in order to have the most optimal experience? And that, again, that's part of that, that journey mapping exercise that we go through. For us in particular, because we are predominantly e-commerce B2B marketplace um, you know, focused, we're looking at those points of friction. You know, how quickly and easily can they, you know, can they register and come in? Right? How quickly and easily can we you know, get information about them in order to tailor the experience um, that they have? And then ultimately, you know, getting them to bid, buy, and ultimately convert the, the transaction. So again, that, that traditional kind of e-commerce um, flow. We look at that and then we start uh, unpeeling for the types of personas because again, we operate in multiple different countries, industries, et cetera. And so while it sounds like a very you know, generic uh, flow, um, unpacking that down into the, the different types of customers um, that will come through is where you start to get that, that uniqueness and that personalization that comes from the tailored journey. Thank you, Steve. So my, my, my next question also, I think it connects to what you just said. Um, so how do you decide on what to build and how do you sort of approach this process? So for us, we, we start, again, predominantly with friction, um, you know, here, here at the beginning, because, uh, again, we're, we're established um, businesses. We have a, a very well-established, you know, buyer base. Um, and while we want to grow that, uh, you know, certainly it's about removing friction throughout the process. Um, and so, again, we continue to look at that buyer experience. And I'll, I'll give an example. We, we launched um, a direct-to-consumer uh, brand under All Surplus Deals uh, about two years ago. And so while we're predominantly, you know, business to, to business um, in our retail space, uh, we sell a lot of um, retail returns merchandise. Um, and so, you know, you think your, your big box clients, again, at the end of the life cycle, they will ship those products to us and we will turn around and, and resell them. 
predominantly a truckload and pallet level. Um, and then we realized, hey, there's a lot of consumers that would like direct access to this as well. So we enabled an experience that is bridging that, that online and physical to allow consumers to come to our warehouse and pick up an item. So they're bidding on individual units, you know, out on our also plus deals website. Um, and when they, when they win that particular auction, um, then they go through and schedule an appointment and show up at the warehouse for, for pickup. And, and when we, we designed this, we did a great journey map. We said, here's what the experience is going to look like. And we launched it. Um, and then we immediately discovered about 10 places where we had, you know, I would say unforeseen friction, you know, in the process that we just didn't anticipate. And some of it came from, we had identified our, our persona as this individual consumer who was going to come by. What we found at the start was a whole lot of folks that, um, you know, I would say a number of them were, were like tabletop flippers, right? They're going to sell on a Facebook marketplace or, you know, or others, which is great. We love them. Um, but instead of coming and buying two or three items, they were buying a hundred, 150 items. Um, we hadn't really set up for that at the start. Um, and so that required us to relook at our personas and go, we need to optimize for both now. And again, remove that friction um, out of the process. Great. Thanks, Steve. So um, obviously, when, when you build um, such digital journeys, technology plays a, a huge part in it. Um, Andre, um, how, how can um, technologies like API-led integration help building such digital journeys? And what's your experience doing so for Hardro? So I mentioned this Unity program that we have, where we had to literally connect all those lines of businesses. And I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, so we are an API-first company. Um, Mosin Naim, my chief architect, who's back here. Mosin, raise your hand. Um, my chief architect, director of architecture, he really helped develop this API first architecture approach at our company. Um, when we had to connect all these different systems all over the world, we literally connected tens of thousands of systems to pr produce a single seamless experience for our customer. You know, the customer doesn't need to know when they sit down at the slot machine here and you put your Unity card in and it says, Welcome, Andre Gowans. Um, Here's your points. Would you like to use your points to spin a, to make a spin after you enter your pin? Um, would you like to use your points to buy a drink? Although we give free drinks to most of our customers, um, but in order, the customer doesn't care that when they did that, it navigated across you know 20 different systems uh, to figure out that you're Andre Gowan, to figure out that you're at that slot machine, to figure out that you have this many points, to figure out your loyalty level. Um, but we had to connect tens of thousands of systems. At this casino alone, we have thousands of slot machines and table games, craps, roulette, blackjack. Every single one of them is connected to Unity. Um, in order to do that, to connect all these systems here and at all of our casinos, hotels, cafes, online, everything all over the world, we need to have a solid API platform um, beneath all that. So we chose WSO2 to be our API and integration platform for two reasons. One, because it has an advanced robust API and integration platform, but also because it has an identity and access management, or in this case, customer identity and access management, SIAM. Um, the connecting of all the systems, critical, con incredibly complex, but authenticating across all those systems, and so that you can pr produce a single sign-on when your customer logs in one time, and then you authenticate across all these different systems um, is critical. So SIAM, along with API integration, was critical. That's why we chose WSO2 for this capability. Um, this, integrating the world here for Hard Rock with Unity, incredibly complex. And I'm going to compare it to something I did before this, I was at Wynn Las Vegas, but before that I was at Marriott. And at Marriott, I was part of the team that deployed Bonvoy. You know, Marriott, amazing company, Bonvoy, amazing loyalty program. We were developing Bonvoy at the same time we were integrating Starwood, which had thousands of hotels. And so we're connected, we're, we're replacing and, and integrating all this technology while we're also delivering Bonvoy for 7,500 hotels. Massive, massive implementation. But the complexity of Unity that we've been doing for the last three years, and, and now we're pretty good, but let me tell you, it's been rocky for the last three years. Um, the complexity is vast, and without a solid API-led platform beneath all that to help facilitate the connection of all these systems, it just wouldn't even be possible. I can't even tell you the, the level of effort we've had to exert to do this. Um, it's been massive. But uh, because we had WS2 as a technology and as a partner helping us with this, um, they made it possible. Great, thank you. Um, so over the past two days, um, and, and maybe part of today, we've been 
discussing about the role of um, identity and access management in uh, in in the whole digital experience building story. Um, Steve, do you think um, CIM uh, or uh, custom identity and access management is a, has an important role to play here? And, and if so, in, in what way in building digital journeys? Uh, absolutely do. I was going to say, for, for us, it's an element of trust um, for the customer. At, at this point, customers have become more and more, I would say, educated about protecting their own identity. Uh, you know, it's very I ironic. I was going to say, I had yet another email today of yet another uh, company that lost my information, right? I was going to say, I don't know how many of you have got those emails. I was going to say, it's turning into you know, seemingly one every few weeks at this point. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that, but one of the elements is helping customers protect themselves um, and protecting their identity. Um, and so going back to my earlier talk of don't solve, solve problems, you know, this is an area where we're partnering with somebody that really specializes in it, um, can help you speed that transformation up um, and again, for us, in terms of the digital journey, it's about ensuring we have the right technology to secure and protect that identity. And that, again, it's helping establish trust with the customer when they come in and say, gosh, yeah, uh, you know, if I'm familiar with authenticator apps, I can use my authenticator app, or I want to use my, my one-time password, or I want to use whatever, giving the customers choices, you know, in terms of how they protect their own digital identity inside of your ecosystem. Thank you, Steve. Um, so we spoke about API management integration, IAM within this process. Um, Andre, did you have to uh, think about any other technologies, especially when it comes to, let's say, working with um, the, the amount of data that you may be collecting in all these sites and things like that? Um, what are some of the other technologies and systems uh, you had to think about in, in building uh, these digital journeys? So when you think about all the systems and all the lines of businesses, the goal at the end of the day is to make things easy for the customer, right? I mean, you don't want the, the customer to know any of the making the sausage in the background. Um, and so in order to do that, there's other technologies in addition to the API, in addition to the SIAM technology. Uh, I'll, I'll mention three. Three key to pr produce these personalized digital experiences. One is data, right? So data. So you have to have data. It all starts with the data. You can't provide a personalized experience unless you know you have information about that customer, you know what customers are interested in doing, and so it starts with data. We have you know, hundreds of databases all over the world. We have SQL Server, we have Oracle, we have Snowflake, um, and we bring in data from you know, every slot machine, every point of sale, every property management system, every casino management system, um, you know, CRM platforms, but it, it all is about the data, and so that's critical to pro providing a good personalized customer experience, you have to know what they're interested in. You have to know what to do with that data too. So you can pull all this data together, you know, you, you use uh, WSO2 to help bring this data together, but now you have to figure out what you can do with that data. So the second technology is a customer data platform, CDP. So we've got multiple CDPs, but uh, bringing this data together into your CDP, um, both the customer data, uh, from your customers wherever they're engaging with Hard Rock all over the world, and then your other data that's either anonymous or non-anonymous data that you collect off of your digital assets. So as your customers are navigating your websites, your, your mobile applications, you're collecting data from these customers, um, and you're bringing it together ideally into your CDP, and now that enables you to really start understanding, using AI and other um, algorithms, understand what is important to your customer. So you come up with your segments and your populations of, of guests that, that come out of, your CD, out of your CDP, and you understand that Mary VIP is part of the segment of, uh, of uh, a population of users that's interested in Latin music, and she loves curl. And so you use your, your um, CDP and all your data, you come up with these segments of um, a list of, of customers that are interested in stuff. And so that's the second technology, CDP. The last, and I kind of mentioned it, is um, analytics. And so using analytics, using Google Analytics, using Adobe Analytics, both of which we use here, to understand what your customers are doing as they navigate your digital assets is critical. Um, and again, bo it's both known customer data and then anonymous data that you pull from your digital assets where you use analytics and ideally you marry it with your profile data um, that you get from your loyalty platform and your other systems so that you can understand what you what's important to your customers. So analytics is the last technology I'll mention. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so when, when you 
start this process of building digital experiences, um, what are some of the challenges that um, you have encountered or one will encounter in this process? Uh, it could be technical, it could be non-technical non still. Uh, Steve, can I uh, start with you just to share your experience? Sure. Uh, our biggest is getting, getting to clear priority. Um, we have lots of constituents, uh, again, across the variety of, of, uh, of platforms. Um, and the, the trap that we can find ourselves in is getting caught in what I'll call a feature factory. Right? So uh, I'm just churning out the next feature um, that's there um, because we thought it was a good idea or we had a good idea. And, and it may be as opposed to saying, how does this feature actually fit into the complete journey end to end? And where is it we're trying to, to take that customer in there? So uh, again, trying to ensure that we are keeping the product focus as opposed to just the, the, the feature execution because it's, it's easy to fall into that, uh, I would say, that feature build trap um, as, a, uh, as an organization. Andre, um, would you care to share some as well from your experience? Happy to. That's a really good one. I didn't even think about that, the prioritization, right? Because you know, across Hard Rock, we have so many lines of businesses, everybody wants to do something different. Right. So the challenge and trying to figure out how do you intake and figure out what you're going to work on is, is massive. Um, another one is data. And I talked about data, but that is the number one most important thing to provide a seamless, curated digital experience, having data, knowing what, what's important about your customer. So the challenge is figuring out where is that data? How are you going to get the data? How are you going to bring it together? And then once you have that data, the challenge is what are you going to do with it? And I talked about kind of what we do with it and how we overcome that challenge. But, um, but it's data. I talked about it a lot, so I won't talk about it anymore. Sure. Um, yeah, so my, my next question was actually going to be about overcoming some of these challenges. But I think you've spoken about it a little bit. Um, Steve, is there anything that you would like to add to it otherwise? Uh, so in, in our particular space, again, as we, we go through the, the, I would say, the feature factory challenge is, is transparency, I would say, and data, right? So we look at those analytics and we use that to inform then the priorities um, that, that, uh, that we're going to work on, um, again, because we have lots of ideas. We have lots of, uh, again, seemingly competing priorities and sometimes can, can compete uh, in terms of what that experience uh, should be. And so at that point, uh, we're, we're leaning heavily on the data to try to inform um, that decisioning process. Okay, thank you. Um, so once you have built um, these ex experiences, um, how do you know whether they are effective and whether you achieve what you want um, with them? Uh, Steve, can I start with you? Uh, customers vote with their wallet. Um, so you can survey. And, and we do survey quite frequently. I was going to say, we run surveys, we ask for feedback, we collect it there, we look at the analytics, but at the end of the day, they vote with their wallet. Um, so if you have created a great uh, experience and you have the right product, I'll say, you know, in the, in the sales book, it's right, the right product at the right time at the right price, you know, you're going to, to consummate that transaction. You're going to have a happy customer. Um, if you don't, and we've introduced that, that friction, you know, in the path, you're going to know that as well, because at the end of the day, they're going to vote with their wallet. Andre, do you have anything to add to that as well? Definitely the revenue, right? Either they're, they're buying, they're not buying, they're using your technology, they're not using your technology. You can see who's using your websites, your mobile applications. You can understand what tabs they're clicking on, what, what they're not clicking on. So you can, you can see all this stuff. Analytics is critical. Um, surveys, for sure. Uh, customers take surveys and they tell us what's important to them. Um, ratings, right? So your mobile app, you have a rating of your mobile app and either it's good or it's bad. I think Unity is now at five. Motion is our mobile app at five now um, in the Apple Store and the Google Store. So, um, uh, so the ratings are important also. Right. So how have some of these um, digital experiences that you've built um, impacted your organization and your business? Could you share some um, insights about that as well? Andre, I'll start with you. Up to you, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, if you're producing good experiences for your customers, they're coming back to the hard rock, right? They're coming here for all kinds of things. They're going to your websites. Um, so it's, pro it's produced, doing all this work, right? Bringing the world together, massive lift. Let me tell you, it's been really complex for the last three and a half years with Unity. Um, but, but doing all this produces a great seamless experience. It drives up revenue. And so we see it driving up revenue. You know, you have your business case, you measure your, your outcomes and so on. But it drives, up, it drives business, it drives revenue, and then lastly, it um, drives brand recognition. So the Hard Rock is a big brand, right? Seven out of 10 people in the world recognize Hard Rock. Now, before Unity, we had nine loyalty programs, 
And that was extremely frustrating. When Mary VIP would come to the Hard Rock Cafe in Miami um, and earn some points and go to Punta Cana and try to use those points on the beach to buy a, a strawberry daiquiri, they didn't know who she was. She had to join a new loyalty program. When she went to Russia and tried to go to the rock shop to buy a t-shirt, they didn't know who she was. When she went to Columbia Cafe and tried to use her points, they didn't know who she was. She had to have up to nine loyalty programs. So extremely, extremely frustrating. Now that we produce a good experience by bringing it all together, um, you know, people appreciate it. So not, seven out of 10 people recognize Hard Rock, and we hope that they have good thoughts about Hard Rock. The so brand recognition is the last one. Thank you, Andre. Um, Steve, could you also share some of your experience with that? Uh, sure. As a, as a platform operator, which is what we are as a, as a marketplace operator, it's about generating what we call the flywheel effect. Um, so by having a, a good experience, we attract you know, buyers in. The, the expansion of the buyer base attracts the sellers in because they want to, again, recover the most value for their assets. Uh, the more sellers you have, the more assets you have on the site, which can bring more buyers in, and again, hence the flywheel. And so that's really been our, our growth. So by continuing to uh, enhance that user experience and just tailoring those journeys, again, we accelerate the speed of the flywheel, um, which we've seen then reflected in the growth of, of the business. Thank you, Steve. Okay, I've got a, I've got a question. <laughs> so um, we've, we've spoken about the role of data in, in all this process. So um, building uh, digital experiences, uh, we, we can't do it without collecting data from users, right, or in that process. Um, what are some of your thoughts about um, this data collection aspect? Because there are so many regulations around the world about this as well. Um, so what are some of your thoughts about this as well as how do you do it in such a way that, um, you know, it, it's, it's done the right way? With you. Sure. So my thoughts are it is heavy, right? It is heavy. So GDPR, um, California's regulations, uh, there's uh, Nevada rate has regulations around data. Um, but basically everybody has to conform to GDPR because, well, not everybody, but we have customers from all over the world. We are ob obligated to conform to GDPR. Um, and so it's heavy. It's a lot of work. And when you have systems all over the world, and you're collecting data from here, 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 and here. It's really complicated to run it all through and make sure you're doing the, you're collecting the right data, not collecting the right data, deleting the right data, forgetting the right data. Um, so it's heavy. Um, some of it we do manually today, and some of it we have automated. Uh, so we use tools like OneTrust to help us kind of collect. You know, what are the central um, library of customers that have requested to be forgotten and requested to be uh, copies of their data and so on. Um, but, um, but some of it's automated, some of it's manual, and it's a lot of work. Uh, but, but the bottom line is it's critical because you have to conform to these policies, otherwise you run a file and um, you can be fined and such. Thank you, Andre. Steve, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, uh, just mimic really what Andre said. It's, it's a complex you know, problem, and so you have the, the compliance layer there, and then you have the trust layer. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the minimum, right, is, is to make sure that you're in compliance with wherever you're operating. Um, and so if, if you're not familiar with those, get familiar, uh, so you need to be there. Um, and then using that as, as, again, as an element to, to reinforce the trust with the, with the customer, right, that I'm going to collect information because ideally it's in their best interest, right? We're going to tailor an experience uh, to them, but again, recognizing the boundaries um, that come from their, their choice within a, a GDPR or others. Um, you know, then impacts that. So. Thank you, Steve. All right. All right. Um, I have one last question for both of you, gentlemen. I'll start off with Steve. So in this process of building um, digital, um, tailored digital experiences, what are some of the lessons learned uh, from your perspective? Mm -hmm. Again, clear identification. I hate to repeat myself. I would say clear identification of the, of the customer persona. Um, and then... Uh, where and how you're going to measure success um, in, in that journey. Um, a lot of times, again, we'll have an idea you know, or I'll have a hypothesis, but not a good way to measure it. Um, and that for us is, is oftentimes just as important as building the experience itself, is figuring out how are we going to, to be able to prove it out. Andre, how about you? Yeah, I'll just reemphasize um, the importance and challenges of collecting the right data and doing the right stuff with the data and figuring out how you're gonna use it to bring value to the company. I mean, that is one of the most significant things to deliver personalized digital experiences. 
um, measuring it, critical, right? Because we've spent millions of dollars doing stuff that turns out, oh, the customer didn't really want that. Whoops. You know, that's, that's not a good thing. But you need to measure it and come up with your measurements in advance before you do it. Figure out how you're going to measure this thing. Determine whether or not you can um, survey and, and get customer feedback either based on data or direct feedback before you do it so you can figure out whether it's worth spending the millions of dollars on so you don't, after the fact, figure out that you spent millions of dollars for no reason. But measurements are critical. Exactly. Thank you. With that is, you know, for us, rapid prototyping and testing, yeah. Yeah. right? So take that test and learn approach as opposed to build the whole thing and then find out. Because we've all been there, right? It's hard you know, to get to the other end and say, yeah, we, we have a project we need to scrap. Well, no. All right. Um, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and uh, sharing the insights. Sure. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.